Okay. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming along. My name is Arne Wieberg. I work in the CERN cloud team, and today I'm going to report on how we integrated ironic and bare metal provision, provisioning in our, into our private cloud service. So to set the expectations a little bit, um, this will be an operations talk. I'm not an ironic developer. Um, I will report on why we are using bare metal provisioning at CERN, um, how we set up the service, what kind of issues we hit, and uh, what our plans are. When I say we, this is, of course, a team effort, so I'd like to thank the mayor, Daniel and Mateusz, who contributed a lot to, to bring the service to a state it is in now. Now, briefly about CERN, before we start. Um, CERN is the European Organization for Nuclear Research. Um, our mission is to understand some of the mysteries of the universe and answer some of the fundamental questions that we have about the universe. For this, um, we use a tool called the Large Hadron Collider, which is the largest machine ever built by mankind. It's a particle collider, which is built into a 27 kilometer long tunnel, 100 meter underground. And in this tunnel, we accelerate particles, uh, protons, but also ions, and bring them to collision. And then we have, at the collision points, um, we have basically big digital cameras, which we call detectors, which will look at what happens at these collisions. The particles actually are very close, have an energy that's or a speed, velocity that's very close to the speed of light. So they do 11,000 turns per second in this tunnel before they are collided. And they collide at a rate of roughly 1 billion times per second at each of these interaction points. And then the detector records these, these events and extracts the data, and the data is sent through some filtering and we store in the end something like 200 events um, per second, which is a few gigabytes. So just to give you an idea of how a detector looked like, this is a photo of the, of the CMS um, detector. And to give you an idea of the, of the scale, um, such a detector is, is about 10,000 uh, tons heavy. And I don't know if you have spotted the physicist already that's in the picture. He's here. So this is like cathedral-sized machinery that is looking at the tiniest um, particles. Now, when the data is extracted, <coughs> like collisions, what, what happens there is like it looks like something like this. This is like a photo of or like an, an, an event of a heavy ion collision in one of these um, detectors, Ellis. Um, the data is analyzed. And then, as you see in this animation in the top right, um, the physicists are basically looking at these signals and compare them with uh, theories and try to either confirm these theories or find deviations. So here what you can see is, for instance, a signal that led to the discovery of the Higgs boson and confirmed that there is actually this new particle. The analysis of this data is not done at CERN alone. This is done in a distributed grid, the WACG, the Worldwide LHC Computing Grid. This is a um, compound of um, 170 data centers worldwide, which all put their storage and capacity, capacity together in order to do this analysis. And CERN is um, roughly contributing 20 or 25 percent of these, of these resources. In total, in the whole grid, there's something like 800,000 cores and, uh, well, zero or 900 petabytes of data on, on disk and tape. If you want to learn more about CERN, um, I invite you to visit our public website at home.cern. We can lot, learn a lot more of what we're doing and um, what's happening. Now, the CERN IT department, so the IT department at CERN is not a research department. It's a service department. It's there to enable the laboratory to fulfill its mission and also to help the physicists to do this physics analysis. For this, there are two data centers. There's the main data center, which is uh, at the laboratory in Geneva, close to Geneva. And then there's a second data center, which is 23 milliseconds away in, in Budapest. So we have two data centers because we hit the power and cooling envelope in our current data center, and we had to like, have a second data center in order to provide the resources that we needed. These two data centers are connected via three dedicated 100 gigabit links where the data is transferred. And we have resources for compute, for instance, on, on both sides. And also we use this in order to disaster recovery um, in case that that's possible for the various services. Now, 2012, so like roughly five years ago, this was a turning point for, for IT. Um, 
because the, the computing requirements that we had from the LHC were constantly increasing. Moore's law would help, but only to a certain degree. And the tools we were rely relying on were basically tools that have been developed in the context of EU-funded uh, projects. These projects were, were running out, so it was unclear how the maintenance of these tools are going to, is going to move forward. Um, and also the tools were not made for the scale that we were envisaging for the next couple of years. Also, it was pretty clear that although the resources would, or the demand for resources is increasing, staff would not grow um, in the same way. So we had to find a way to actually manage all these resources with a constant amount of staff. Now, actually, 2012 was a pretty good um, time for us because when the, acceler the accelerator schedule has like large breaks, which we call long shutdowns, where the accelerator is basically stopped for, for a year for upgrades and for maintenance. So LS1, the, the long shutdown one, was just ahead, planned for the next year. And the next window opens only next year. So you see like the scales at which you can do massive disruptive changes. Um, luckily, we were in the situation back then, and are still today, of course, that other deployments have surpassed um, CERN's deployment. Beforehand, we were one of the largest um, um, sites worldwide, but by then there were other sites that like overtook us in terms of how many resources they had to manage. So we could profit from this and we started something that we called the Agile Infrastructure Project with three main components, which was um, we installed some centralized monitoring, we introduced a new configuration management system, and we introduced uh, infrastructure as, uh, as a service based on OpenStack. This came with the policy that all servers and all services should be virtualized. Now, <clears throat> it was then when we started the OpenStack service and OpenStack, the OpenStack service at CERN went into production um, in July 2013. Since then, we have quite some, some upgrades. We are mostly on Queens now with uh, Nova being moved to Queens only a couple of weeks ago. We have many subservices deployed, as you see on the right-hand side, I have a list of um, services that we have. Our OpenStack deployment spans the two data centers that I, that I mentioned before. We have only one region for this because we want to present the users only one uh, API entry point. Um, we're running with Sales V2, um, which is pretty new. As I said, it's only three, three weeks ago, two or three weeks ago, that we introduced this with 70 cells to actually manage the scale that uh, we have at the moment. So you can see on the right-hand side, you can see our dashboard, and we see that in our cloud there are roughly 300,000 cores that we manage. This is like 9,000 hypervisors. Um, as I said, we are a heavy sales user. Um, this is mostly to separate hubs. I mean, the main reason for sales is the scalability, but it's also in order to separate different hardware, separate different use cases, for instance, for our batch computing versus services that we run. Um, we use this in order to steer virtual machines to specific locations, have the separation between the data centers and so on. All of this is deployed with RDO, so we use uh, CERN Center or CentOS, uh, like, um, well, we use CERN CentOS, which is uh, almost CentOS, uh, and Puppet in order to configure, configure things. This is all mostly upstream, so we're trying to not have our own um, thing uh, going on, but rather use upstream and then feedback into the community in case there's something that we change. Many of the subservices that I listed in the top right corner are running on OpenStack itself. So like Cinder or Manila, all these services are running inside VMs. Um, and not on physical machines. Bootstrapping is, of course, an issue that we um, keep an eye on. So we have some physical machines, for instance, for, for Keystone, in case the whole cloud has an issue. Now, <clears throat> if all of this is so great, and it's also working, working so well, and we have virtual machines for everything, why do we want bare metal provisioning? Why do we add this? So let me motivate why we're looking at bare metal provisioning. So VMs are not sensible or suitable for all the use cases that we have. So our storage servers, for instance, they are not virtualized, and there's probably no point in virtualizing them. The same is true for the database nodes. We have HPC clusters where they really want, like to squeeze out the last um, possible cycles for their performance. As I said, I have no, we have some nodes that we need for bootstrapping. There's some critical network equipment that is kept apart as physical machines. Uh, we have some very specialized network setups. Um, and also the experiments have them, some machines that they need in order to validate and do performance benchmarking of their software frameworks where they need very repeatable, uh, a very repeatable and stable platform. So what we decided is to complete our service offering and add to the service 
where we already offered virtual machines and containers, also physical machines. And with Ironic, the nice thing is, of course, that you can keep using OpenStack as the single pane of glass. So users, no matter what kind of resources they want, virtual machines or containers or physical machines, go basically to the same interface and request these resources. Another reason we introduced this is to simplify the hardware provisioning workflows. I will talk about this uh, also later. For users using Ironic and OpenStack, it is very, uh, it's very easy to get resources because all they need to do in principle is OpenStack server create and then the servers will basically give them a physical machine. So compared to the usual cycle that we had before where users actually need to specify what they want and then we would buy a physical machine, we're talking about months versus a couple of minutes. But it's not, not only for the users, it's also for the procurement and hardware provisioning teams. Um, there's a complicated workflow when new resources come into the data center in order to register them, burn the resources in and install them. Um, and there's also a lot of reassignments going on. So um, users have physical machines for a year or two. They don't need them anymore. They give them back and then they hand it out to other users, which is also a complicated process because you need to make sure that you have, you track all the accounting, where the machine is, who owns it and so on. And we wanted to simplify this and Ironic is one of the tools that can do this for us. Another important point is to consolidate the accounting. So we have, we support something like 10,000 users. The main user groups are these experiments that I mentioned earlier. And for us, it's important to know who is using how much of these, of these resources. If you have these resources um, only in one place or managed by only one tool, there's only one place you have to go to in order to find out who is using how many cores, how much RAM, and how, much physical, how many physical machines. And also the machine reassignments that I mentioned earlier, it's much easier to track if you have like a single tool that actually helps you moving these resources back and forth. Last point is to enable new use cases. So we're <coughs> using Magnum in order to do container orchestration. And for instance, our batch farm is, is running on virtual machines at the moment. Um, there is some virtualization tax that you have to pay for this. If we manage to use containers on bare metal um, using Magnum in order to provide these clusters, this may help us to um, squeeze out the last performance bits. So this is why we're doing bare metal, but it doesn't change our overall policy, okay? So for everyone who's getting resources at CERN, there will still be virtual machines because the original reasons why we introduced OpenStack and virtual machines have not gone away, like efficient um, resource usage or the time to actually get resources, the provisioning time um, for virtual, to reduce the provisioning time, all of this is still there. So service managers that run services at CERN are still asked to use virtual machines for this. Now let me brief, briefly introduce Ironic. So <clears throat> for those of you who have never um, heard about it, so, uh, Ironic is the bare metal provisioning project in, in OpenStack. Um, it provides or provisions physical machines just as um, virtual machine or allows Nova to do so. And the user itself interfaces only with Nova. The user does not talk to, to Ironic. So as you can see here on the right-hand side, the user basically requests a physical machine just as he requests a virtual machine um, with a special flavor, as I will explain later. And then Nova basically assigns the corresponding compute node and uses the Ironic driver to then talk to Ironic. And Ironic will then find the corresponding physical machine and gives that back to the user. So there's no user interaction with the Ironic service. It all goes through Nova. The one that interacts with the with the ironic service is uh, the administrator, which I depicted here myself with a nice tie, where you actually enroll these um, machines into ironic and make physical resources known to, to the system. Okay. Um, ironic <coughs> manages these hardware via common interfaces, but also via um, proprietary or vendor specific um, interfaces. What we use, for instance, mostly um, Pixie and IPMI, and these standard interfaces allow to have a unified interface to a variety of hardware. So, so to give you an idea, alone for, uh, for our hypervisors alone, for these 9,000 machines, we have about 50 different hardware types already that we um, plan to manage with this. And in the whole data center with all the storage ser servers, database servers, and so on, we have a lot more of different hardware. Also because there's like many ge generations of hardware machines that are basically bought and then they're getting older and you can't buy the same ones. So all of these 
um, will be abstracted by Ironic. Diving a little bit more into how Ironic works, so Ironic um, basically follows the um, same, say, architecture that you know from many other services. So we have an, an API server that receives and authenticates the requests, basically the request handler, which then um, RPCs to um, the Ironic conductor, which is the real working horse managing the request and orchestrate the, the task for the individual nodes, such as adding them or editing them, provisioning them to user, deleting them, cleaning them, power on and off, all, all of this. The third component is the, the Ironic Python agent. So the Ironic Python agent is something that runs in the RUM disk when the node is, is basically booted and, for instance, prepared for, for deployment. Um, the Ironic um, Python agent provides then access to other tools to actually interact with this node, for instance, in order to do specific, specific things like the, the inspection, so to look for specific hardware, which is then um, stored in a database. So this component is called the Ironic Inspector. And then there are like the standard components like a database, the Ironic database, where you have some of the service data. So you have, for instance, a list of all the physical nodes that are there. You have a list of all the services that are running, and then you have a message queue to facilitate the communication between the individual components. So how does our service look like at the moment? So our service looks very simple. So what we have at the moment is um, three conductors. All of them, they are all symmetric, which is a very nice um, setup in Ironic that you can have symmetric um, controllers in contrast with other services like Cinder, for instance, or, or, or Manila, where you have specialized servers that, for instance, run the, the share service or the volume service. So our controllers that are depicted in the top right are basically running the API, the conductor, and the inspector. There's a database and a rabbit um, message queue. One of the nice features of Ironic is this automatic conductor affinity. So it's very easy to add more nodes if you want to, or remove nodes if you have to take them out. Um, the nodes, the physical nodes, will be automatically assigned to, to these conductors. We're running Queens um, at the moment, since a couple of week, weeks. All of this is based on CentOS 7, also with RDO, and it's all configured by Puppet. So at the moment, we have like 1,300 nodes enrolled in our service. So that means that we have 1,300 nodes that are managed by Ironic. 90%, um, 1,150 roughly are active. So active means that there is a physical instance that has been allocated to users. And at the moment, we have 30 out of these 50 different hardware types already in this list. The main, users is, uh, the main user is OpenStack itself. So we use our Ironic in order to provision our hypervisors. Not all of them, but we have started. So basically, we create physical instances on top of Ironic, and these physical instances then become hypervisors for OpenStack. There are also other users, of course, like the aforementioned HPC colleagues, um, the machines that we hand out to Windows, to one of the experiments, CMS, to the DB guys, and um, I don't know what dot dot s means. Um, you also see a um, um, snapshot of our dashboard that we have, so you can see the nodes that we have in, this, in these different states, and also how we have nodes per conductor. So one specific thing that we have is, as I said before, we are using cells. So we are a heavy user of cells, as I mentioned before. Um, and when we introduced Ironic, we were using cells v1, OK? Um, in order to make this happen, because cells v1 is an unmaintained um, piece of code in order to allow for scalability, we carry some patches. And one of the patches is actually allowing us to map projects to specific cells. So what we did in order to accommodate Ironic is that we have a bare metal cell. So the way it works is basically we have the top cell, which receives the request, then it's going to the top cell scheduler, which then, depending on project metadata, decides which cell this request should go to, and we leverage this in order to send it to the bare metal cell, and then the compute nodes in the bare metal cell basically use the Ironic driver in order to talk to Ironic and provision the physical machines. We don't mix virtual machines and bare metal at the moment. We also have a QA deployment. So in order to make sure that when we change something in Ironic, we can actually test this properly. So we have a def setup uh, separate, but we also have a QA setup. And it uses the same mechanism. So basically what we have is we have a QA cell where we um, 
map certain projects, and then if you do something there, you basically in the QA cell and you were rerouted to these specific set of controller nodes, which is completely independent from production. Okay? And in order to do this, we use endpoint filtering so that if you talk to Ironic, you're actually talking to the right um, controllers. So this is just a brief one to, to show you how we, how we set up our QA, QA cell. Now, integration with networking, this is like a big thing uh, in Ironic. In our case, <coughs> It's a little bit simple and complicated at the same time. The CERN network structure is relatively simple. Um, we have no segmentation, um, which is not fully true. We have separate networks, for instance, in order to control the accelerator, but for what concerns the cloud, there's not se separate networks. It's basically one huge um, flat network. What we don't have is, for instance, for storage, separate networks for management and for, for users. Um, we have no managed management network uh, for OpenStack, and also for Ironic, we haven't added any provisioning or cleaning network. So it's the same network basically everywhere, which is a little bit specific. So it's in, in that respect, it's very simple. On top of this, we don't manage the IP or the network ourselves, so we have a dedicated team at CERN that's looking after network, and we basically only interface with their databases and their tools. Um, as an additional complication, we are currently in the transition between Nova Network and Neutron. Um, so we have some cells that work with Neutron, some cells that would work with Nova Network. Um, so basically what this all boils down to is that we are, our network setup and our running is relatively simple, and we had to patch Nova to actually not do very much when it comes to networking. Um, basically what it does, it doesn't try to get an IP or set or configure anything. All it does, it basically updates an entry in the database of the networking team. Okay? So in this way, it's like, for us, it's relatively simple, because that can become very complicated, of course. We also integrate with other services at CERN. So for instance, with the config manage, configuration management system. So in order to harmonize everything that we do with the way we handle VMs, when you instantiate a physical node, so if you create a physical instance, um, we don't create an entry in our configuration management database, which is based on Foreman. So for a user, it's, it's the very same whether he creates a physical machine or a virtual machine. They don't have an entry in that database, which is then also related to the way um, they run Puppet, Puppet. And then we have a wrapper around this that actually allows to do this registration. The IPMI credentials were stored in this as well, traditionally, because the physical nodes that we have before, they were, in fact, in this database, and you would get the IPMI credentials from the database. Now this is all moved to Ironic. Or for the Ironic managed machines, I should say, this is all being moved to Ironic. And what you do is open the console URL show, as you know from VMs, and you would get the credentials for the physical machine. Another point where we actually do not have set up anything in Ironic, which would be like the standard thing to have, um, a Pixie or TFTP server, Pixie and TFTP server in order to run the or get the deploy image is we run, rely on the central service that we have at CERN, which is run by the Linux team. Um, we mostly did this because it's there and we could use it and we don't have to set up our own, um, our own system. So there's nothing set up on our conductors. We basically rely on the services that are offered. There were some minor modifications and additions that we have done in in Ironic. So in Ironic itself, what we did is we basically created a, a subclass of the, um, of the driver. So the driver is the part in Ironic that actually manages different hardware. So we have a subclass to the Pixie and IPMI2 driver, which is called the CERN Pixie and IPMI2 driver, where we have like minor modifications. So for instance, we always force to boot a server from, from the network first because it's just the way we run it at, at CERN. And also for the console, we have something that overrides uh, how we're accessing the console, because we had some issues with the ironic web console and shell in a box. Um, we will pick this up again, but at the moment, it's basically only returning the, the credentials. And then on top of this, we have a small module that actually does the interaction with our, with our networking services. For the inspector, we also have a small hook that actually allows us to specify new things that the inspector should actually look for when it's doing its inventory. So it's uh, called the hardware properties where you can actually add something like um, the number of disk arrays that you have attached to a server, for instance. And we are overriding the ironic URL. This has mostly to do with the QA setup that I um, explained before to make sure that actually the service is talking to the right, to the right endpoints. The main thing that we did, however, is the CERN hardware manager. So the hover manager in Ironic is something that runs in the IPA in this Ironic Python agent, which is part of the deep image that the node boots into in case there's cleaning or deployment. 
Okay, so for, for uh, usually this is needed in order to run specific tools, for instance, for, to configure the BIOS. And, and we have created a subclass of the generic hardware manager. And the CERN hardware manager, what it does, it does this additional hardware inspection that I just mentioned. So it counts the disk arrays, it checks how many InfiniBand adapters we have in order to facilitate the scheduling later. It also does some more stuff. So for instance, when you have uh, a physical instance that you have handed out to user A and it comes back, you wanna make sure that it's um, properly cleaned. So there's a cleaning step in Ironic that makes sure that everything is um, cleaned up properly. Um, what we also do is like we're checking, for instance, the IPMI settings. So we try to catch if someone had a physical node and added an IPMI admin user, which would allow him to still get into the node if the node is handed out to someone else. So we check, um, we check this. In future, we will also like change the password, which we don't do at the moment. And it also deregisters the node from the central Pixie server after the installation so that we don't enter a, a, a continuous reboot loop. Work in progress, we're currently working on the software rate configuration. I will cover this in a second. Now, one thing that we did differently from what, uh, how the IPA usually works is that when you have to change something in the IPA, usually you have to rebuild the deploy image. Every time you change something, there's a new image. Now you can automate this, um, of course, but what we did is like basically we changed it so that when it starts, it basically git clones the code so we could basically change the repository and use, reuse the same image. So it would also always be the same image, and right before it starts, it basically git clones into the node and has the latest code. So this avoids that we have to rebuild the deploy image. We rely on the same one all the time, which is pretty um, helpful in order in, if you have to develop something. So we had some challenges, let's call them. So one thing that we ran into is that a user came to us and says, my node is going down all the time. So we were a little bit confused to so what happened is basically that the, the user was starting the node and then something shuts the node down. And that, that was really confusing. So we, we looked at, so this is basically the trace how we looked at this. So we looked at the Nova instance actions list to actually understand what's going on. And yeah, there's like a stop command, a stop request. So we looked in the conductor logs and we said, yeah, there's power off. Someone tries to power it off. And then we looked in the API logs and yeah, there's someone asking for it. And actually it's Nova itself. So Nova. Uh, is, not, is shutting down our nodes. So why is that? So <coughs> Nova will sync, in our configuration at least, when you shut down a virtual machine by yourself, shut down minus H now, it will update the database and say, okay, this is now shut down, okay? However, Nova syncs the instance if you do it the other way around. So if you bring up the virtual machine, Nova will actually shut it down. Now, for virtual machine, this is not so much of an issue because users usually can't bypass Nova in order to bring up a virtual machine because they don't have access to the hypervisor. However, with physical machines, they can do this because they have access to, to IPMI. So they can basically bring the node up. Nova doesn't know anything about this and shuts it down. So this is what happened here. So um, the options in order to fix this are, or include, to disable the synchronization, of course. So this is what we did for now. Um, you could also make the instance the source of truth, so it only goes one way. So whatever the instance says is true and you, you update Nova. Or you remove the IPMI access completely from our users, but the users usually don't like this because they're used that if they have a physical machine, they have a physical machine and with everything. So I'm not sure that we can convince users that this is the best way. So the next thing that we ran into is what I called scrubbing the bathtub. So if you remember this graph I had earlier, so this is basically showing the, um, the affinity of compute nodes to the conductors. So remember, conductors are the nodes in the ironic service that manage these compute nodes. And as I said earlier, you can basically take out nodes or add nodes, and then ironic would rebalance which conductor is responsible for which node. And this is what you see here in the middle. So I, the blue one, I basically take out the node, and the number of nodes that this conductor manages goes down, which is pretty neat. So it takes like one and a half hours, and then it, uh, all his 300 nodes or so move to the other conductors. However, it doesn't go down fully. So if you see there, there's like, it keeps some nodes. So there's like a couple of nodes that it, uh, it are still associated to that, to that uh, conductor. And we, ha we haven't fully understand why that is. So as I learned yesterday, the way it works, and this is also why the lines are not exactly the same, is basically a hash ring where all the conductors constantly compute which compute nodes are associated to it. This is why it's not like, or the, the hash ring algorithm is not perfect. This is why you get, end up with different lines, but it's not clear why it doesn't process some of these entries. So this is something we have to look at. 
Another challenge that we had is what we call location-dependent scheduling. So if we get a delivery of so and so many machines, they may go to two different buildings. Okay? And then the users would make to or would like to have control over when they create a physical instance that it goes to a specific building. For us, however, there's no real difference between these nodes because they look all the same. They have the same number of CPUs, the same RAM, same disk, same everything. Um, so what we needed to do is like to invent something so that the user has actually control and can control where the nodes go. And what we did is in Pike, we used flavor capabilities and no properties. So basically we attached a property to the node to tell it where it is. This is not, in our case, it wasn't automated. It was just something that we set on the node after they have been installed. We just say like, you are here and you're over there. And then the flavors um, reflect this. In Queens, now we use resource classes to do this. Uh, we don't use trades at the moment. I will explain that why in a second. Um, but then we have like resources that look like this custom bare metal and then they have the delivery number and the building number or the, the IP servers, whether it is. So it becomes very, very longish. So if someone have, has a good naming scheme for flavors and resource classes, let me know because that is getting like really ugly. Now the biggest challenge was the upgrade to Queens. So as I said, we have this multi-cell deployment and we moved from Nova from um, basically Okata over Pike to Queens. And this also meant to move from sets v1 to sets v2 plus some backported uh, patches for, for scheduling. So we ran into some known issues and some we could have known issues. So one of the known issues is that, uh, that in, in Queens, the scheduling, there's like this new service called placement and we had to move from properties and capabilities that I just explained and introduced in order to, to move to resource classes in order to do this. This was something that we knew before and we prepared. This was okay. However, um, when we brought up Ironic after Nova was upgraded, Nova couldn't talk to Ironic anymore. And the reason is actually that Nova Queen re requires a certain version of the uh, Ironic API, which Pike, Ironic Pike didn't, um, didn't provide. So what we had to do is like we had to, well, we could have known this because it's explicitly mentioned in the Ironic Upgrade Guide. So if we would have read this, we would have known that it says like, don't upgrade Nova first, always go upgrade Ironic first. We read this after, so now we are much smarter. So we had to like emergency, upgrade Ironic in emergency uh, on a Friday afternoon, okay? So there's no, no joke, this was pretty exciting. <clears throat> it was the first emergency upgrade I did. Um, but we also had some surprises. So it took us quite a while to bring Ironic um, back with, with Nova Queens. And the issue was mostly scheduling. So as I said, there's this new service um, play, called Placement, and then you have the scheduler, which tries to find uh, physical nodes. Um, in our case, that works with aggregates in order also to do the, um, the project to sales mapping. And this needed, needs to manually update it. So you need to manually update these aggregates so that the resource is actually known. So this is something that we initially forgot, but then we realized quickly that we have to do this. Um, in our deployment, however, in our bare metal cell that I mentioned earlier, we have multiple compute nodes. So these are virtual machines. In our case, we had six or seven, which were taking care of the underlying um, physical nodes. If you do a failover or you switch off one of these compute nodes, there's basically new resources that are cr created for the corresponding physical nodes. And these new resources also need to be like, mapped to the um, corresponding aggregate. So in the end, what we did is we, we basically, when, when uh, compute nodes went down, we basically lost some of the or contact to some of the of, of the nodes, and we couldn't schedule them anymore. So in the end, what we did is reduce the number of compute nodes in the bare metal cell to one, so that we don't have this issue anymore. But then there's also like the resource provider upgrades, updates the resource provider aggregations update took too long. So what Nova does, it basically goes through all its resources and sends the information to, to placement, and it does so for the compute nodes and the corresponding um, bare metal nodes one by one. And this takes very long to a degree where it, it basically broke. So we removed the whole thing, and we, this whole trace collection doesn't, it has been removed in the bare metal cell. So this is also one of the reasons why we don't use trace. Traits. So after we've done this, this took us a couple of days to actually understand and fix all these things. Now it's, it's, it's working fine again. One of the things that we were working on <clears throat> and that we would really like to have is deploy times of RAID. So the majority of our machines in the computer center use software RAID. We have removed hardware RAID a couple of years ago, um, basically. And we have basically two types of RAID that we use. We have, for the batch farm, we use um, 
uh, RAID 0 and we have RAID 1 for, for the service. And it would be really great if Ironic would support deploy time RAID so that if a user requests a certain instance, it's deployed with a RAID 1 or with a RAID 0 rather than you have to prepare the nodes beforehand and you have a certain amount of nodes that run with RAID 0 and a certain amount of nodes that run, RAID, run with RAID 1. And then you have to like reshuffle in case there's higher demand for one or the other. So this is what I mentioned earlier. We have started to work on this in the CERN Hardware Manager. I learned yesterday that others are working on this as well. So maybe there's some, some progress with this to like include this into the official um, ironic code base. Our, our hardware manager is very simple. All it does, it looks for all the devices and t creates one type of RAID at the moment. So there's no petitioning, there's not multiple RAIDs or anything. It's, it's very basic and simple, just what we need. Now, the other thing that we wanted to do that I mentioned earlier is to include Ironic into the procurement workflows. So this picture shows how our workflows look like at the moment, okay? So this is the whole workflow. I won't go through every box here. This is basically the whole workflow, how machines run into, into the computing center. It starts with, in the top left corner, I can't even read this myself, but it's just something like idea to buy new hardware. Okay, so this is where it starts. Then there's a tendering process. Um, well, there's a market survey for first, then there's a tendering process. The hardware is bought, the hardware arrives, the hardware is installed, the hardware is burned in, the hardware is allocated, then the hardware is retired. And this is all described in this graph, okay? And the, the, the parts that are encircled with, with, the, with the red line, they are currently done by Ironic already. So this is the allocation. When users actually get physical machines, this is done by, by Ironic. The reallocation, so when nodes come back and they are given to new users. And what we are currently working on is burn-in. So what is burn-in? So when we do hardware purchases, as I said, this follows a very strict procedure with a market survey and a tender, and then we get large deliveries once or twice a year. So large for us means a couple of, I don't know, a thousand nodes or a couple of thousand nodes, something like this. And then before we do the acceptance, we actually burn these servers in. So we check that they're actually complying with the technical specification. We try to find failed components that are in these, in these nodes, like a broken RAM. We look for systematic errors, so firmware issues. And we also try to like, stress the system in order to provoke early errors. This whole process takes weeks before the machines actually become productive. The initial sex checks include something like the serial asset tags and the BIOS settings. So we basically request that when we buy hardware that um, there's a certain amount of, or a certain data inside the BMC which allows us to uniquely identify a node. So in this case, the delivery ID and a serial number, which we call the serial asset tag. And this is the unique identifier which we also later on use in Ironic to uniquely identify a node. And then we run a couple of burn-in tests. So we check, basically, we check the CPU, we burn the CPU, we also do this in order to check cooling, for instance, to detect broken fans. So we see issues when machines overheat. We do RAM tests. For this, we use bad blocks. We have a small um, tool that does network tests where it pairs a node and it transfers data between pairs of nodes. So it's basically, they basically um, advertise that they're ready for testing and then they find a pair and the two of them basically do this um, benchmarking. And then we do CPU benchmarking itself to make sure that the capacity actually bought is what we wanted. So CERN buys compute capacity, not specific server generations. So we need to make sure that if we buy this, afterwards we got the compute capacity that we asked for. And we, for this, we use a benchmark called HEPSPEC, which is a modified version of the original CPU Spec 06. And there we can detect things like, so the, uh, like on, you see on the right-hand side, so what we discovered actually in a delivery is that on a few percent level, we see machines that behave slightly different. And this is like a systematic error where we found that some of the hardware threats on specific machines actually are slower than others, slower than others. And we, we de detect this kind of things and try to understand where this comes from. So in order to integrate this now um, with the procurement workflows, so what we are trying to do is like to converge all this into a single image. So the ironic deploy image will become the only image that does all this burn and test. So at the moment, the procurement team has the, their own image in order to do all this. And we're trying to like converge all this into one. Now, one of the issues is that if you have only one image, the burn and test, for instance, which we would hook into the cleaning state into ironic, would take weeks. So if you give back a virtual mach uh, physical machine, we cannot wait weeks until someone else actually is able to get this. So we're looking into how to do this, and one of the options is probably to uh, look into automated versus manual cleaning. So manual cleaning is something where you can define what kind of steps are actually done in this cleaning step, and we could use this in the initial state when we enroll nodes. 
And then the automated cleaning would be something more lightweight where we just erase the disk, for instance, and then check that the passwords are okay. And then the next step would be to like, do the initial node registration. So in this big workflows that I showed before, to also atta attack or address the other um, components that we haven't looked at yet. What we have at the moment is we have additional hardware, uh, additional databases where we keep track of things and we record, for instance, what firmware level is running on which hardware. Okay, so this is needed, for instance, if you run campaigns, which we had to run in order to upgrade the disk firmware. So we know that a certain disk firmware is bad, then we need to know, okay, which servers out of our 12,000 physical machines actually runs that firmware, and we need to identify them. So this is in separate database, and we're looking into whether we can have this information in, in Ironic as well. The other thing that we need to do is like this information that we have in these hardware databases is used by other tools at CERN. So for instance, our ticketing system has access to some of the information about the hardware. Um, there's also the security team that needs to have access to things that we know about hardware. So it's not clear at the moment how we're going to do this. But I learned this week there's the so-called ironic observer role, which is kind of a read-only um, mechanism meant exactly for this. So we have to look into whether we do this. And then one of the things that we want to look at, we, we deployed recently Mistral, which is a workflow engine, to um, leverage this in order to have, um, combine this with um, Ironic in order to do certain operations, like, for instance, boot into a specific image, flash the firmware, and so on. And this is just a plan. We haven't looked at this. Now, the last thing that I want to talk about is new use cases. So all of this is like trying to do something we already do in a smarter way, but there's also new use cases. So <clears throat> as I said, we are a heavy user of, of Magnum. We have a Magnum deployed in our cloud with more than 250 clusters, mostly Kubernetes, but the nodes of the clusters are on virtual machines. So we have um, Magnum clusters, containers and Magnum clusters. The clusters run on virtual machines, which run on physical nodes, of course. And the batch farms, for instance, run runs in VMs as well, so it would be great if we could squeeze out um, the last performance out of this and run the batch farm in containers. And we're also thinking about making this a general service offer, so it's basically like um, the users would only get a Kubernetes endpoint and the cloud team would basically run the infrastructure in the Magnum clusters, so the users don't have to care about how the nodes in the cluster are actually doing, we would do this. The integration in principle should be seamless because, as I said earlier, the strength of Veronic is that you use the same interface to manage physical machines as you do with um, virtual machines. So it's um, actually pretty straightforward. One of the issues that we have to look at, though, is, is monitoring, because um, if you have a physical machine, you need to make sure that actually it's integrated with our monitoring so we actually know if something goes wrong. So we may have a pod in that cluster that we create that takes care of the monitoring, and we look at various tools in order to, to do this. So to, to sum up, we moved Ironic to, to production in the CERN cloud. We had no major issues, apart from the Nova upgrade, which was pretty, a little bit more hairy. Um, we have some minor modification to make our lives easier. We already have more than 1,000 instances on 1,300 nodes that we have deployed. Um, and we have now the policy that all physical nodes that we hand out to our users is handed out via Ironic. All new deliveries go through this. Uh, we're working on the existing your, uh, workflows to integrate them into Ironic as well, and there are some new use cases that we're looking at at the moment, but there we are. Um, well, we have done some things, but not enough yet. And one topic I didn't talk about at all is um, how to enroll servers that we already have. So, so far, all the nodes that we hand out with Ironic are basically new nodes or nodes that come back, but we have um, 10,000 other nodes that we actually have in the computer center that are not managed by Ironic and that should be handed out by Ironic. And that's all I had. Thank you.